Well, hi there, racing fans, and welcome to another edition of Winning Ways, where we'll bring you up to speed with all the latest that's going on around the whole of South Africa and the world as far as racing is concerned. And uh, with me today, uh, our first substitute, uh, Andrew Harrison. Nice having you, Andy. Thank you, James. Pleasure. Lafferty, um, I hear there's been problems with him, you know. Well, he's got more air miles than Harry's son, so it's not bad. Well, not much more, but the point <laughs> is that apparently he didn't take it too well, you know, that he got went to the Cape and got beaten. I said to him, don't worry, you know, they'll got to come to Natal. You'll beat them in Natal. Yeah, yes, yeah, it's, he it's, it took the one in their backyard, and yeah. I thought, thought he ran a pretty cracking race. Great race. We'll be chatting about it later, and we'll be chatting to Mike de Kock in uh, your call all about quarantine regulations, there have been some problems during the week, and his horses in Dubai, he's going to bring us up to date with them. Yeah, I'd like to know how Via Africa is doing. I'd be very interested to see how I'd like goes to know how the 52 are doing. Because, oh, uh, all of them, yes. Lots, yeah, of, sure. lots of opportunities <laughs> over there. Right, well, let's go and have a look at our three to follow. Right, the first one we're going to in uh, three to follow, and uh, really I think I must have been in a coma when I found this. But uh, anyway, we've got to put it there on the show. It's uh, been produced and put forward. Pure Blonde, first race at Turfentine, juvenile race. Uh, there was a hell of a lot of money for this. I watched it and I thought, well, maybe this is one to follow. So maybe it'll come out at six or seven to one next time and win for you. Let's go and have a look. There she is, drawn eight, and uh, Mike... Uh, this time, colours very fast. He is, is he's a Cajal, uh, and really he's quick as hell. No, uh, yeah, um, that, that sort of family I think has done very well. Um, just surprised not racing in case it ended. I think uh, Patrick Lunn had the. Uh, yeah, he's trained for that for legally them forever. Blonde, I think, yes, yeah. Yeah. Legally blonde, he trained the mother, and he's trained for them forever. Yeah. Anyway, had absolutely no chance with uh, the one of Azzy's down the inside, and uh, my goodness, that one I could race uh, very quick. Rock Burn is its name, uh, J.P. van der Merwe and that. But I thought Legally Bond, uh, um, this was pure blonde, uh, ran quite a nice race, but it was well beaten by the second horse as well. Now, this, this horse type of these 800-metre scurries, I don't know, you can't read too much into them, and you probably find uh, when, when, when it goes 1,200 much better. Well, yeah, probably maybe the run under the belt. Anyway, uh, that's a sort of, um, you know, bit of a difficult one to find for you guys. We were battling to find three to follow, but let's go and have a look at the next one because this really is worth following. Let's go to the Vol, 18th of December. Have a look at the Mile Straight. Paul Peters run at Amsterdam. There it is, drawn one. How this started 25 to one, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> well, you know why? Because it was a very, very strong field. But he's there in the red and white colours. He tucks in behind them. Now he's about uh, three off the left-hand side. And there's some good horses in this race. There are a couple of horses that um, have shown some real good ability. Because I, this, this horse, I mean, it was green all the way. Um, Chad sort of tucked him in and then got to the point where he had to let him go. Well, the horse that looked like the right one was also Adam. He had run a very good race his first, um, first start. He ran fourth behind Sunny Bill. That looked like good form. Um, the horse that ran second, uh, Dance and Destroy, um, that had run third behind Sunny Bill. So that form looks like uh, if the winners come out of that form line, then this is a very good horse. I think he's a fair horse. I mean, the way he quickened, I mean, he was green all the time. He, uh, Little, just keeping him together, keeping him together. And then once he got him straightened up and balanced, he just strode away from them. Well, here are the two favourites. Here are the favourites on the outside, and it looks like he's going to win it. That this horse just quickens up. It, it's ridiculous how he quickens up. It quickens up like a star. Uh, the Eurster horse on the outside ends up running second. But Orson Adam looks like he's got this feel stone cold at this stage. And now watch this horse. Gives him a couple of left-handed smacks, Chad Little. Doesn't look like he's not just hands and heels. No, he won a really, a really, very good race. 
Yeah, he's a Windrush. Uh, Paul Peter trains him for the Hyper Paint Syndicate, and um, he might really be uh, a nice horse in the future, bred by Highlands. Let's go and have a look at the next one, and uh, we're going to go to Kenilworth. First race on the big day on Saturday, Guineas Day. The Snaith stepped out a good one. They thought they'd win Buckinghamshire. We picked that up, but it got well beaten by Dennis Dryer's runner. Let's go and pick him up. Comes out of the pens very nicely. It didn't really well, get no, away that didn't, well. No, it didn't get the, away that yeah. yeah. He's got that no. white blaze. He's in fact, it's Hassan Adams' now. colours. Yeah. He's got a little bit of a check there and he moved through. In front, you've got the winner, which uh, pinged the pen, seventh plane, really cruising along. But this was now Buckinghamshire had made up a lot of ground. He's on the right-hand side from last to just about first in a matter of 400 metres. He's obviously got a lot of ability. No, I think he's a nice horse. Um, he just gets a little bit tied towards the end, maybe short of a, just short of a gallop. Or well, maybe just um, did a little much in the race, you know, he's uh, really did it the hard way. Slow rush faded seemed to be one way of... Um, it's one way of describing it, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Getting, them, um, uh, getting them beaten and uh, I think this horse, uh, they backed him to five to four favourite. He's by Lonro, um, there he is, uh, back picture of him. He looks like he's pretty good, so we think that um, certainly the second and third horse are worth following, and maybe the, the first one, and an each way price would be eight, ten to one next time it runs, have a close look at him. Let's go and have a look at Bloss from the past, we got the diadem stakes from last year's Cape Town summer season. Couple right going in. Well, Witcher comes forward. We set, ready to race. 1200 meters. Diadem stakes. All clear. Sprinting from that 1200 meter mark. Capo Wright began well and he's drifting over to the inside rail. Villa de Largo electing to stay hot up against the outside. Behind that, we got Tevez, Castle Thorpe, Captain Secret. We've got two groups down the hill towards the 800. The inside group is being led by Capel Wright. Then it's well which year Divine Jet and Jackson. Stand side, we got Villa de Largo, Captain Secret, Tevez. And behind that, we got Castle Thorpe as they enter the final 600. They spread across the track. Stand side, it's Villa de Largo and Tevez, Captain Secret, Castle Thorpe. The inside group is being led by Capel Wright. Divine Jet on the rail creeps close to Welwitcher, and Jackson is in striking distance, being angled to the middle as they enter the final 400. Villa de Largo, Tevez, Capel Wright down the inside. Divine Jet starts to pounce. Welwitcher's into the clear. Jackson up the middle is also starting to run on. Outside of runners, we got Captain Secret. They fanned right across the track. Welwitcher gets driven into the lead. Divine Jet is on the chase towards the inside, but Well Witcher has kicked away. Well Witcher goes on to win it. Jackson comes out vexed in second. Then it was Capel Wright, Divine Jet. Well, the big point there was the brilliant ride that Kevin Shea gave uh, the Philly Well Witcher, but uh, Jackson ran a cracking race in second. He ran a cracking race, and then everybody expected him to pick it up and, and go on for the, for the Queen's Plate and the Met, and he just just, he didn't go on with it. Nothing um, fell into place for him. Yeah. But I must tell you, he's at stud and he is being heavily supported. There's, they think a lot of him. I think John Freeman manages him. And yeah. he's, um, he's a stunning horse, stunning looking horse. Stunning looking yeah. horse. And he definitely yeah. had ability. Yeah. But there was something, he never sort of, I don't know, he showed patches of brilliance and then he, he went off all the time. So, yeah. Yeah. He might have been a hemoconcentrator. Quite know, possible. Might easily yeah. have been. But anyway, he ran a cracking good race there, his first run back. And um, we thought um, it's well worth having a look at this race. Comes up in the next week or two, the diadem. It's a good race to watch. Uh, the weekend, we'll go and watch uh, the Plum of the Week, which uh, really is a good winner.
the field for home. Princess of the Sky is racing back in second. Lana Falcon and maybe yes, just in behind those. Now Eventual Angel starts to make good progress down towards that inside running rail and Miss Saigon is tracking that as they race down past the final 400. Princess of the Sky, meantime, has come forward to pick it up. Lana Falcon, maybe yes, between runners is coming home nicely. Lana Falcon has come forward at the front, maybe yes. Down towards the inside, Eventual Angel is back in third. It's Lana Falcon who's hanging out, maybe yes, putting on the pressure down the inside. Lana Falcon and maybe yes, these the two. Lana Falcon hanging tough. Lana Falcon stays on to win from maybe yes. Miss Saigon gone flashed home for third eventual angel behind that was back in fourth they were then well a long time since her last win this filly interbet you could have got four to one about this filly and she ended up starting two to one you could have got five to two at the death on interbet uh one of my favorite fillies andrew i love this filly she's always been a, a filly that's always there always there always there you just had to find the right race for her and this was it and, and i mean she won very well i mean Finico didn't even pull his stick. He just punched her up and she went nicely. I, I think you'll see the second horse is worth following next time it runs. Maybe yes. You know, she's come back from a bit of a break. Lana Falcon had had two or three runs on the mm. trot. She was yeah. fit. Yeah. Well, that's why you've got your form book. Yeah. That's exactly <laughs> what the form book's all about. And that's why um, we like the new computer form. That's out now. We're going to go and uh, chat about everything that's going on in current affairs. We've got some interesting news. Well, we got a couple of big races from the Cape, as you know about it, was the start of uh, the real good racing. We've had a couple of serious racing, but this, the Cape Guineas was um, highlighted by the fact that Harry's son made the trip to make it into a real Guineas. And um, we start off, though, with the Cape Stayers, which was a quarter of a million rand race, and very, very open, and I thought that a masterful ride by Anthony Del Pesce. Let's go and see what happens through the 800. Body. He's easily 14, 15 lengths off that leader. At his girth, we find Gothic. A length and a half next, we find Kvatni Flyer, who's sitting on the inside of River Crossing. Then comes Dynastic Power, and Cold Train sees them all as they straighten up, head towards the 600. Dynasty's Pride is still a useful leader. Leads the field into the home straight by eight or nine. Up there in second, we find current event. Tribal Dance starts to close ground. Wave and Flag is still ten lengths off that leader. Putney Fly is coming to the inside. Gothic is coming up the middle with 350 metres left to go. Dynasty's Pride is in front. Still a useful leader by five lengths. Now the chase is on. Current event is out the pack. Gothic into the clear flashing. Wave and Flag taken off towards the inside. Dynasty his pride is running on empty up the outside cold train from the clouds he's coming home full of running with gothic it's cold train with his head in front drawing to the judge cold train beats gothic current event dynastic power wave and flag well very very good win i thought a great ride by anthony del Pesh. what is interesting is if you read the new computer form you'll see that this is bred by vulgarbos drift stud usa limited Cost 1.25 million as a yearling. I'm not sure that this is all right, but uh, Vilgerbos Drift, if they did breed it, they're part of our uh, their sponsors. Of this segment. <laughs> I'm just looking at my, my prompts here. This is bred in Argentina, so yeah. uh, we've got it all right there. <laughs> well, uh, who knows where, how, but he's by chance Causeway Coltrane. Um, it was a big week for them. No, it was, yes. And, but I, th I thought they went so slowly in the beginning in this race. I mean, the, I could have jumped off and beaten them in my gumboots. Yeah. Uh, and I think 
keep it. Did he, Cold train just outsprinted them. Are you that quick in your company? I used to be quicker. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Look at your action now. <laughs> no, well, I'm not starting out of the room. And you need more than Dr. Fleming to help you. <laughs> <laughs> if I need lead poisoning, it'll probably help you. <laughs> anyway, we're going to move on and have a look at um, the Cape Guineas, which is always a highlight of the Cape season. Let's go and see what happened there. Moves forward, completes the lineup for the alternate first leg of the South African Triple Crown. They racing from that 1600 meter mark in the Grand Parade Cape Guineas. Slow of the mark was balance sheet and not that well away too. Was along the inside Zambezi River. Getting away quickly was Light the Light and Brutal Force is up there with the speed. Then comes Captain Alfred of the White Cap. Harry Sun pushing forward. King Vault 3 deep on the move outside of runners. Next in running on the rail comes Imperial Gold and Act of War is going to settle about eight lengths off that leader. Three quarters back on the inside we find Zambezi River. Then it's Arniston, Parachute Man. A length and a half further back we find Balance Sheet and Charles Lytton. ML Jet is content to race back one from last and Sherd trouble is racing at the end of a stretched out field 16 lengths cover them through the middle of the bend towards the 800 in the grand parade cape guineas light the light is in front from brutal force in second then we find captain alfredo king vault harry's son act of war is creeping closer then comes imperial gold arniston zambezi river corners 10 off the leader next we got balance sheet parachute man charles Ditton, sheer trouble ml jet whipped them in as they flatten for the run to the judge head towards the 400 light the light Harry's son is quick to move in towards the inside. Act of Wars into the clear, deepest of all flashing. Between runners, we've got Zambezi River. Down the inside, Harry's son, but Act of War is coming on full of running. And Act of War now gets driven into the lead from King Vault. Harry's son is towards the inside, but Act of War, with 100 meters left to go, has kicked for home. And he's powering home to win the Grand Parade Cape Guineas. Act of War hands and heels from Harry's son. King Vault, Imperial Gold, Zambezi River. Well, the question is, how good is uh, the winner, Act of War? James, I think he's a very good horse. But I think the jury's still out, in my opinion, anyway. Um, Harry's son, I mean, he's been up and down to Joburg twice, flew to Cape Town. He went out to the start. I think Pierre had to chase him to get him down there. Mm. It just didn't look like he wanted to do anything. Came out of the pens, sluggish. Pierre chased him, picked up the bit, and then he had to try and find a place. Mm. Um, and I think he ran a cracking race. And, uh, and Active War got the run of the race. He, uh, Bernard Fader rode a, a brilliant race. He just sat in behind him, picked him off. So, but I would, I'd like to see them win again. And it's very interesting when you get horses, two horses that are this good, um, as to which ones turn out, which one turns out the better of the two. And I think that the point being, is that Harry Sun done it the hard way and went to Cape Town and still ran two lengths off this horse Act of War. But Act of War has done since he got beaten first time. He's absolutely pulverised everything he's run against. And the word out from the stable is that he is very good. No, I think he, I mean, there's no doubt about that he's really good. I mean, and, and Joey said in the post-race interview that he didn't think he had him at his top. He sort of had a flat gallop the week before. So you've got to take that into account as well. Um, but I'd like to see them meet again when everything is equal. Jo Joey's uh, had a good week. Yeah, I mean, it's a good an day exceptional well. week. Listen, Joey's a blooming smart trainer. I put him right up there with the best in the world. He's really good. Yeah. And well, you absolutely right 100 percent. he's got the right background um but five winners on the day that's um some it takes some doing yeah, yeah. No. and the, the eustas six winners on the day yeah. you need the ammunition yeah. there's no doubt about it i mean you can be the best trainer in the world if you haven't got the ammo, ammo you, you're going to fire blanks a lot of the time yeah but it, it it's uh, amazing to see a horse like this come through the ranks i know king volt was talked about the right horse in the yard all the way through the two-year-old careers. And then suddenly this horse pops up and he, King Volt can't live with him. No, no, King Volt ran a good race. And they, as you said, he was rated by the stable. Mm. I mean, he actually passed Harry's son. Mm. Uh, and Harry's son came back at him and, and, and beat him to the line. So I think we've got two exceptional horses here. Really and the, the rest were well beaten. They don't, they don't even come. Yeah, they were, they were good horses. I mean, Zambezi River was unbeaten. Um, brutal force, I don't know, probably needs to be two stone lighter. Yeah. Yeah. 
All right, well, fantastic racing in the Cape, and um, really, uh, you've got to say congratulations to Hassan Adams and his team for putting this together. There were a thousand kids on course. Uh, they all got hamburgers and gift packs and whatever. We'll show you a little insert next week if we can get it from Andrew Bond. Um, just to see what it was all about. But well done to them. Great uh, fundraising and charity affair. Um, and all the charities benefited. Let's go and see what else we got. Um, Andrew, Archie Penko, firing overseas. He's firing, yes. Yeah. So you, you, you tell me. Uh, uh, he was supposed to, wasn't he supposed to go to Ascot Stud at one stage? Dude? I, I think that they, that was where he Did was. Did the Parker still have a yeah. share in it? But he's, yeah. he's the leading two year old Tsar percentage winners to runners, which is in Europe, which is phenomenal going. It is phenomenal, and I'd like to have a few shares in him, yeah. Well, you could have. Could have. <laughs> <laughs> they don't take bottle tops. They don't take bottle tops, <laughs> okay. Um, the sad news was uh, High Chaparral uh, died during colic surgery. He had a peritonitis. Yeah, he looked like he was going to, well, he was a top stallion. Um, I think he's a great loss to the industry. Yeah. Very interesting to read about him because, you know, he won the English Derby and the Irish Derby, then he got beaten in the Arc de Triomphe, and then he went to overseas and won the Breeders' Cup. Um, and then the next year, he went for the Arc again and got beaten again in the Arc, but then won the Breeders' Cup again. So what does that tell you? The Arc is a better race than the Breeders' Cup. <laughs> <laughs> very perceptive. Very, very yeah. little prayer you are. Okay, well, let me see. Um, what else we got? Uh, just to, to a couple of his top horses. Um, he had Toronado in the Northern Hemisphere, and So You Think was the big one from the, the big Southern one in Australia, Hemisphere. Yeah. Yeah, but he did better, they seem to think, in Australia. So You Think, they did better, So You Think, in Australia. Does that work? Yeah. Uh, he probably got to all the top mares in Australia, but I mean, he, he was he was a Coolmore horse, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, Coolmore horse. A couple of other little points. Um, uh, Jamie Spencer uh, was the non-event of the year. <laughs> you asked me the question earlier. And I, I gave him a week. You said it. How long was it? Seven hours and fifty-two minutes. It was, it was a hell of a retirement. retirement. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie Spencer. Well done, Jamie Spencer. Nice to see you back in the saddle. Maybe you'll come out of the Jockeys International one day. Old Friends. Now, I had to mention this because uh, Old Friends is a, is a horse retirement home that was um, set up in America by a guy called Michael Blowen. 2003, he set this up. And um, they are getting the Eclipse Award at Kentucky for uh, their contribution to racing. And what it, what it made me think about is that surely there are people there who are you know, wealthy enough to set up a farm and put retired horses on the farm. And Old Friends doesn't just have famous horses, they have some really, really, really famous horses, including that horse um, Golden Sense that won 19 mm. races and all those type of horses. There's the horse that holds the, holds the world record for consecutive number of winners. Cigar. Uh, and, you know, they're just a fantastic operation. Do you know how many horses they've got? 166 horses. That's a lot of horses, but it's probably also a commercial operation. I know they've got one in Australia too, where you see horses like old horses like Bone Crusher and those sort of things. And and people come to see them and they come to visit them and pat them. And these are the horses we backed and we made a lot of money out of. So, you know, and it's yeah. So you can, you can work it both ways. Well, they tell they say on their website that they have up to a thousand visitors a week through their doors. But it is a pure non-profit organization. This guy donated the land. He set it up himself, Michael Bowen, and he looks after these horses. Whatever monies they get in goes to paying the horses, feeding the horses. They have uh, help workers who come in that uh, do it for nothing, that uh, will look after the horses. And, you know, I, I just think it is an amazing, I, amazing I think thing. it's also a very good way of promoting racing you know we're trying to get people to the course and yes. all that. but if you get horses like senor santa and uh, what's that horse at p that won the so many races I think oh it's yes up at a, Summerhill. Uh, uh, yeah the, um, the, hear well, the drums yeah hear the drums now the the one person who does do it for some horses but i don't think that she's got the, the setup is uh, sue armstrong yes. she's had a lot of retired horses on her place but maybe it's time racing in south africa looked at ways of setting up a retirement home for not just the famous ones. There's some not so famous yeah. ones that ran their guts out. Yeah, right. But it's, it's, it helps if you've got the, the top horses there. I mean, yeah. You know, the, the, oh, you've got to have them there. Yeah. And I think there's, there's definitely a place for it. 
Okay, well, that seems about it from um, current affairs. Uh, we're going to go into your call where we'll go through a couple of uh, emails and then we'll uh, chat to Mike DeCock about his spring in Dubai. Harry Sun's running on strongly towards the inside. Harry Sun and light the lights. Anjol hot up on the outside. Anjol has his head in front. Harry Sun's coming home. RJ is absolutely flying. Maybe Harry Sun in a thriller. Well, uh, in current affairs, we wanted to show you the latest Val de V. Um, catalog which is uh, the most beautiful magazine uh, I think can we uh, zoom in on this yeah there you go and uh, on the 22nd obviously the bloodstock South Africa Valde V yearling sales is being held but get a, get yourself a copy of this it's a really really good magazine um, Justin Snaith makes it as a polo player in it and really good fun 22nd that's um, where we're going to be 22nd of February for the Valdivy yearling sales. But uh, let's go into our mails. We've got uh, Andrew, uh, George Barnes. He likes sending emails. <laughs> well, the trouble is half of the emails, you can't, you, you'd actually like to read them out, but it's not for public uh, well, consumption. He, yeah, he says, uh, uh, P.S., I'm sure you won't read this email. Um, so I said, well, we definitely won't read that one. Okay, but <laughs> the, the next one, we will, uh, he says, a great interview with Michael Varney. So he enjoyed the interview with Michael Varney. And, um, but he says that the, the whole interview is about the punt. You've got to have the bet. James, basically horse racing is about punting. Yeah. Uh, you can stand on your head and you can promote the, the glitz and the glamour when it boils down to the, to the nitty-gritty, it's about punting. Okay, now I want to read you the last paragraph of his letter. And he says, uh, the, he's uh, very good at me to keep a straight face. I can't keep a straight face. This. You want people at the course, you must give them something like casinos do. I know what the casinos give them, okay? That is different to the course. But he says, I don't see the casinos empty and not a free Borobos roll or brass bit. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> Well, we give them a free Bora Wars roll. I don't think it's rather to pay for their Bora Wars rolls here. <laughs> uh, the time has come for jockeys, okay, this is this, to mingle with the public and try and give them a winner. Let the jocks tip on to the on-course people when they're about to leave the jockey room or something. Everyone that punts likes a bit of inside information. Well, I don't know. You, I've, I think the jockeys I've had a lot of tips from jockeys and they're really bum, I promise you. <laughs> anyway, James, well done for keeping a straight face. Sorry, George, I couldn't keep a straight face through that one. Um, we got this from Jonathan Shaw. Many thanks for your piece on Ivan Moore, true hero of mine in Zimbabwe. He was a champion jockey on six occasions and finished in the top ten in, of South Africa. Would really love a similar piece with Neil Bruss, champion trainer seven years in a row. Well, we'd love to get Neil Bruss. When he comes for the season, maybe we'll grab Neil Bruss. And then the, the last one is from Harry. <laughs> Hi, James and Leff. The Walter Bass jokes are getting a little old now. Well, you'll notice I haven't mentioned him today. It must be three or four shows in a row that you've mentioned it, and it detracts from the quality of the racing show. You're quite right, um, Harry. I don't want to hear how sharp he is, how good he is at golf, or how he is going to jump into his bloody plunge pool. <laughs> Anyway, great show. I try to not to miss it. Really enjoy listening to you guys talk racing. Tell Walter I said hi. <laughs> sure Walter will be listening too. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, those, um, those are the emails um, that we had. And, you know, um, racing, poly tracks going well? Yes, it is. It, uh, I think it's to suit certain type of horses. I've, I'm sort of working out that the older horses, the fives and the six and the seven year olds with the tired legs are. They've actually come come well on the, the, the more forgiving surface. Percentage winners, very high uh, favourites, very very high percentage favourite winners on the poly track. And then you still hear people complaining. Yeah. Yeah. 
Now, there's, there's no doubt if you do your study or form, and you can certainly in maiden plates, um, the right horses tend to win the maiden plates. And I also notice that, that even if you draw wide on the poly, you, you've actually, you, you're not inconvenienced, which is, which is quite nice. So, um, yeah. I, th I thought it might be the other way around, that the inside horses would have the, the advantage, but it's, it seems to be fair right across the board. Well, it certainly looks like uh, down the straight, the jockeys tend to want to go out, so that does help them. Yeah, I think it's quite a sharp turn, so you, uh, you, it's, it's almost like a slingshot effect, so you, you, yeah. you go that way. We're going to be chatting to Mike de Kock, but first let's have a look at um, our winners as far as um, South Africa concerned, Magic Million winners. Well, we've got Flame Cat, and we've also got uh, Royal Security Power. Flame Cat um, was a Gold Coast yearling sell, $60,000 buy, and um, it's turned to be a, out to be a very, very good filly as Flame Cat. We're going to chat to Mike uh, when we get him on the phone um, as to how he's going in Dubai. I didn't realize he had so many horses over there. You said 52 or 53? Something like that, yeah. I thought it would be around 20. So. Yeah. No, yeah. he's got a big string. And in, fa in fact, looking through the string, there are a lot of horses that have hung on, anaerobia and those type of horses that have hung on from last year. And, um, you know, they're going to strut their stuff again. That horse, a Mauritian horse, he's back again. He's a leader. Um, so you mentioned pylon. Pylon, well, yeah, interesting. I'm going to look forward to chatting to Mike about Pylon on the sand, you know, um, see what the story is with him. But uh, there's some really nice horses. Well, he's got, I think he's he scooped the, the, the cream off the South African okay. uh, um, pool. So, yeah, good luck to him. Well, let's chat to Mike. Um, Mike, how's it? Hello, Mike. How's it, Goody? All right, thank you. How are you? No, very well, thank you. Good, good. Um, first, let's get um, some of the bad news out the way. Apparently, there's been a hiccup with um, um, horse sickness and quarantines and all types of things. Yeah, James, I don't know. There's an outbreak in Kyle Army, and now they're stopping the horses moving out of Rancourt team, which I don't know. Just, for me, it's just ridiculous, the whole thing, because, um, you know, we can't move horses around our own country with any confidence. How are we going to expect anyone in the world to accept our horses? They've, they've we've got, got PCR tests, we've got quarantine, and why are we not using it for ourselves? We're pandering to the rest of the world. And uh, in the meantime, it's not good for our own business. The, this, this directly affects you, doesn't it? Oh, yeah, not only me, Jeff Woodruff, uh, Sean as well. I mean, any movement of horses into the free area uh, and any of the horses that want to go and race in the cut. I mean, the precedent is there. Google race out of quarantine. And now all of a sudden I'm being told that that's now pre that precedent does not exist in that protocol. So you tell me that anybody knows what's going on. Well, there, there was a press release the other day from Gary Berman, which changed a whole lot of times and, and dates as far as uh, movement of horses were concerned. Um, yeah. Was that all because of this um, Kyle Army outbreak? Uh, yes, it was. Uh, it, it made no sense to me. It just it didn't make any sense. It's, if you've got this test that you can do, 24-hour test on them, surely yes. that's what they should be doing. Well, what are we telling the rest of the world? That this test of ours is no good or it's not reliable because we can't rely on, on it ourselves. Now, what is all this based on? They make a 20 or 30 kilometer radius or what science is that based on? I mean, this is all, it's all our pandering to the EU and the rest of the world, James, which is just absolute nonsense because what are, the, what are the EU doing for us? They're restricting us as trade. They're not allowing our horses to go. We are handicapping horses. We are doing everything to please the rest of the world. When we should be developing systems that suit us, our racing, and is good for South African racing. Stop trying to pander to the rest of the world. I don't know, I don't know what it is that, we, that, we, that we've always got to be uh, doing what everyone else wants us, wants us to do. Uh. If, if I said to you, what's the solution, what, what, what would you say? The solution is, uh, in my opinion, James, is that we should just, as I said, be doing things in South Africa to suit us. At the end of the day, I'm not convinced about all that's going on with African or sickness at the moment. In fact, I'm completely demoralized. I, don't, I think the only solution is to get direct protocol between South Africa and Dubai, negotiate a protocol with them, and whatever happens, happens after that. I think it's just... This uh, pandering to the EU and everybody else, or America, direct protocol with them, and crack on. I, I think we, we, 
We're beating our heads against the wall with this whole new... It's going to be very, very expensive introducing all these observations and all this kind of thing. When it's, at the end of the day, it's got us nowhere. We've actually done a lot of things right. And then where are we? We are worse off today than we have ever been, ever, James. You know, Mike, I, it's very interesting you say that because I remember doing an interview with Professor Sanna, who's now in charge of this whole thing, and he assured us, okay, that things would change and change very rapidly. That it's, it's, it actually seems to be worse. Well, you know, James, I must be honest. Uh, uh, Professor Sanna has been proactive. At least he's getting off his backside and doing something. But I fear that he's beating his head against the wall. Our, our horsiness is there to stay. It's not going to go anywhere. Yeah. And unless we come up with uh, um, an absolute foolproof uh, um, protocol or whatever, or you know, that, that the rest of the world is going to accept. And no one's accepting it. I mean, I, for me right now, if the EU doesn't accept a, 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 a protocol from us, if Australia do not accept a protocol, all this other, we have got to stop importing horses from those countries. Ban imports across the board. Then it will make them... But I think we need to make our... Uh, um, presence felt through cash. That's the only time people listen. I know, I mean, I'm talking against myself here because I'm probably the, one of the biggest importers of horses in South Africa. But if we for two or three years banned all imports until the people sit down and negotiate a, a, a protocol where there's a reciprocal of, of uh, reciprocation of trade, uh, we're not going to get anywhere. So you, why don't we just ban, ban, ban imports for a while? Do you think, everybody set up, especially do, Australia. Do you actually think that they care? They'd rather carry on the way they are and keep us out of the picture? Uh, I think they do care because we spend a lot of money in places like Australia, Ireland. I mean, we are, you know... Uh, Argentina. I mean, are not big players, we are players, you know? I mean, yeah. Argentina, we can import horses from Australia, but we cannot send them directly back. You know, it's just, it's just ridiculous. And, and that's because there's no direct protocol between the two countries and no one's actually listening. Now, whether it's incompetence on our behalf that uh, our veterinary department hasn't made uh, contact with the people or haven't set the right things in place, I don't know. But all I know is nothing's happening. And it's very, very frustrating. And we can't even trust ourselves to move our horses around. So uh, how are we going to get anyone else to trust us? Mike, I've got Andrew Harrison with me on the show this morning and probably like to ask you a question. Uh, hello, Mike. Um, Morning, is there any chance that we could go sort of via China? I mean, you know, South Africa got uh, big trade links with China these days. Yeah, and we're part of BRICS. I mean, what's wrong with Russia? And the other day, Russia is now the pariah of the world. I'm sure they'll be doing anything to do trade with us or anybody for that matter. <laughs> so yeah, why not? Uh, why not Russia? I, I think we start got to start looking. Elsewhere, because uh, we really, I mean, where are we getting with uh, the EU? We're getting nowhere with it. So, yeah, so it's been your opinion that we've, we've, we've been pussyfooting around and we should just, just go for it now, just stick I, it. I, you know, I think so. I think we've got to stop pandering to everybody now and maybe just get our own protocols between us and China, us and Russia, us and the UAE, just direct protocols. You know, what, you know at the end of the day, I think that'll, that'll work better for us. I, I believe that the UAE is ready uh, to have a protocol directly between the two countries. There's no doubt of it. I've been assured of that by Sheikh and them. But, um, you know, uh, what's happening? I'll tell you what's happening. Nothing's happening. Okay. Well, l let's find out what's happening with you. And uh, you've been there a couple of weeks. You've got um, a whole team of horses there. A um, couple of new faces? Uh, yeah, well, obviously the ones we imported, James, or exported, put it that way, uh, from South Africa. Yeah, eight months ago. Uh, the, yeah, <laughs> the far bend. We went via the far bend. But anyway, we are now here. And um, at this stage of the game, they've all done pretty well. The most of them have travelled very well. Um, are you on track for um, the start of the carnival, the, uh, the real, real racing? I think so, yeah. There's a few that will start the, 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 the early in the carnival. I think a lot of the export horses from South Africa will start later on, I would think, third and fourth meeting in. They'll probably be coming into their own. One or two are coming to hand pretty quickly, um, but we will definitely have runners for the first week. Uh, Mark, uh, just a quick one. Um, Via Africa was trained at Ashburton, so she's a bit close to my heart. I was wondering how she's doing? Doing very well. She's, she's um, travelled extremely well. So she puts her head down, works and eats extremely well, which is a, a big plus, you know, for horses that travel. If they're in the manger, you've got half a battle one. 
Mike, uh, an interesting horse to me is Pylon. You obviously took him there for the Sandys, a very good horse on the Sandys, internationally rated. Um, would, uh, how's the sand fitting in and how's it going? Because it's a new track. How, have you, how are you finding it? The sand's fitting in quite well, James. In order to do, I think the horses are uh, sounder than um, they were on the Tapita. But the Tapita had degenerated completely. I mean, it wasn't, it was, you know, it was bordering on dangerous, you know, which had just, you know, it just had just broken down completely. I think a lot to do with the heat, yeah. Um, and the sand, the horses are, are definitely sounder, you know, it's deeper. Um, and at this stage, it, it seems to be a, a better deal. Well, what are, what are you going to do about shoes? Uh, um, are you going to race in those grippers, stickers? Do they, are you allowed to race in them on the sand? That seemed to be the norm in America where they race on sand, on dirt tracks. This, yeah, I've raced here before, uh, James, at Nadal Sheba. I never, ever used a heel corkin or a gripper or anything like that. We may have used a slightly raised toe behind. That was about all. But um, generally, I'm not into that, that type of thing because um, I think it unbalances the horses. And um, I know you might get, a, in theory, a bit more grip, but I'm not convinced about it. I think the, the side effects of that is, is, um, is injury. What would you pick out there as the early ones that we should be having a look at? Uh, the first meeting, uh, sure. Um, uh, we're probably hoping, hoping to run San Shawi, would be a recognisable name from there. Alistair Rondosa. Only half will run early. Um, Royal Ridge is doing extremely well in the dirt. He's a Tiger Ridge. They love the dirt. Uh, Journeyman's another one that's doing very well. Could be an early starter. Uh, those are the ones that have been here for a while. Visa Leader. Then, you know, of the South African horses, I'm expecting by the third and fourth meeting, um, horses like... Um, uh, What's his name? Your, also, Yorker, Red Tommy. Ray. How are they going? Yeah, Yorker York will be later on. I think Red Ray probably the third meeting. Atomic Rush horse. And Stewie sent me doing extremely well. Uh, Red Ray, we've mentioned, he's doing very well. I'm hoping to run him in the third meeting. Um, Versing Getterix will run the third meeting probably. Uh, yeah, but the young the youngsters, um, we might be in a little bit of trouble there because they've got the Guinness trials, the second meeting. We, we might have them ready, otherwise we're going to have to wait until the, the Guinness races actually themselves. Uh, which would be unfortunate, but um, it's just, we might have to run them a little under done and just see, finally, just see how we've got. Finally, Mike, um, jockeys, how are you going there with those? Uh, have you got uh, the pikeys, have they moved in and parked the caravan? Well, one one party has been around. Uh, what's his name? Wayne Smith. We rode um, Victory Moon from. He's been putting in a quite an effort. Obviously, Christoph will come later, and then um, I think Anton will be here quite a bit this year. With um, with Marcus, got three horses here, so Anton will be coming backwards and forwards quite a bit. So I mean, probably use him a fair bit. And uh, and your your stable rider Simeon is he going to be still riding the Sheikh's horses? Yes, Christoph. Christoph comes out as well. Yeah, he rides, oh. he rides for Sheikh Mum. And then obviously Sheikh Hamdan's got his jockeys, Paul Hannigan and Dane O'Neill. Have you? Have you really got shorter jockeys? Have you got anyone to play golf with at the moment? Um, yeah, I've met a couple of couple of interesting fellas, some musicians locally that uh, enjoy enjoy the racing and love the golf and. Yeah. One or two other guys around, so yeah, there's always the, partners. Good uh, I remember a guy from a quarantine station. He seemed to shoot six over off a 16. Uh, yeah, there's a few of them. <laughs> a few of those thieves out there. You know all about them, James. You're not too bad yourself. <laughs> Mike, you've got to be there the whole of the Christmas and New Year period, so it's tough for you, you know. People don't realize the sacrifices you make to, in order to keep their wheels rolling for us here in South Africa. Um, have a fantastic season, and thanks so much for joining us. Pleasure, James. Thanks, and uh, all the best to you all as well. Mike de Kock from Dubai. Absolute pleasure having him join us as usual and update us on what's going on over there. It's... Uh, Fascinating, isn't it? What an operation. Uh, it's just unbelievable. I mean, he's, he must have well over 100 horses here, and he's got 52 in Dubai, and he's got some in England. The man's a genius.
there's, there is no doubt. But um, what is so interesting is that when you chat to Mike, is you get a straight answer for a question, you know, and that's you find it's very, very unusual in, in interviewing anyone that you get the answer that is interesting to the people out there. People want to know those answers, and he gives them to you. I think it's because he's, 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 he's a font of knowledge, so he, he doesn't have to beat about the bush. You ask him a question, he knows what he's talking about, so mm -hmm. he just t just tells you straight, so it's, it's, it's great. And, and it's very exciting uh, seeing these horses coming through. I know he's been there for over a week already, and he's got to, you know, he's got to sit there. Um, all of us enjoying Christmas and New Year with our families and whatever, he's sitting there getting horses ready for big races. James, you don't, and I, I think... One of the big criticisms, well, not a criticism, but of, of owners, they think you can just switch horses on and off and all that. But the trainer's got to be there four o'clock every morning and five o'clock every night, feeding, looking after them, sick, lame, lazy. It doesn't matter if it's Christmas Day or New Year's Day, everybody else is jawling. They've got to be there. Mm. And, and I don't, people just don't realize it really. If, if you, that it's a 24 7 job. And logistically, when you ch chat to Mike about, you know, the problems with the uh, EU and, you know, transport of horses overseas, it's just ridiculous. I know that Laff was telling me that he had a big problem with getting Harry's son to Cape Town with all types of permits and whatever. You know, they couldn't just put him on a plane and fly him there. They need all types of permits. I think it was that what, that's what Mike was getting at. Um, we should just actually just say, well, you know, we just do our own thing. Um, even if we go via Russia or China or wherever, you can't, we've paid our dues, we've kissed everybody's backsides, and they're just not interested. So I think we just do our own thing. Well, it will be interesting because um, in the next uh, week we're going to have uh, Peter Gibson, or next couple of weeks, he's been involved at the coalface. There was a little press report about maybe there'd be a quarantine facility here in KwaZulu-Natal. Did you know, hear anything? I haven't about heard it? anything of that, no. Uh, you know, everyone's trying to do something, but no one just seems to get anywhere. I think maybe Jacob Zuma could make himself useful for a change and go and sort of sort out the horse, horse sickness. Christmas wish. Christmas wish. Jacob goes to China and organizes it. Okay. Andrew, thanks so much for joining us uh, here on Winning Ways. And um, to all of you out there, well, we hope you have a very, very good festive season. Just spare a thought for um, those that are working with the horses. And it's not only the trainers, but there's their grooms and assistant trainers and all types of people who really will be working over the Christmas period. You guys have a great time with your families and uh, we're going to um, say goodbye to you and uh, Merry Christmas and we'll see you again next week.